So the last couple of times, we well, two times ago, we talked about atomic orbitals, and it's really emphasized the angular momentum, the, the, the angular distribution of the electron cloud that gives us our directionality and bonding. Then last time we started talking about the evidence behind our rules for what's a stable subshell and non-stable subshell. We emphasize a half-filled subshell is stable. We saw that in the ionization energy. So it's not just a claim. We actually see the evidence um, from the ionization data. Um, and then we got into electron configuration for the cations and anions and neutral species and so on. And so then we, it would be nice if we could organize all of those energy levels. And that organization of the energy level is called the Grotrian diagram. I showed a couple in the last um, set of notes, but we'll see more today. This whole lecture is based on understanding the Grotrian diagrams. And so let's jump into those. Okay, so here's the spectrum, the hydrogen atomic spectrum. It's pretty simple atomic, uh, atomic spectrum, as you might imagine, because it's only got one electron. Okay, there's not a much much that that electron can do. There's not a, a lot of variety in its energy levels. You don't have electrons coupling with each other. There's no electron correlation term because there's only one electron. And so these are the this is what you would see. And this was one of the big problems um, for science, classical physics, is because they couldn't explain why they were discrete lines. So when we talk about the failures of classical mechanics, line spectra was the, one of the failures. There was no way to explain this very simple spectrum. Now I'll show this full rainbow, but really the background should be black. So this, this rainbow here is just to kind of show you the electromagnetic spectrum and the visible range where you see the red over here, like at 700 nanometers and over here at 400 nanometers is deep blue getting into the UV. Okay. So the rainbow you see there is not hydrogen. That would be what we call a continuum spectrum. And I'm just showing it to you to kind of show how the colors are spread across the visible region. The bright lines are the hydrogen line. So there's this one, this one, and that one. And that's weird because that shows that there's only three energy differences that are in the visible region for hydrogen. So it's a very simple spectrum, which means that there's discrete energy levels that are available for those electron clouds. So we, you know, without the wave nature of light, this is unexplainable. So de Broglie in his thesis is the one who actually solved this problem. He said, what if uh, nature, the electron cloud around hydrogen, what if the electrons are behaving like a wave, like a violin string? Because a violin string or a guitar string has certain harmonics. So you can play the, the, the fundamental, you can pluck that string and it vibrates the whole way, or you can put your finger halfway down the fretboard and pluck it and it goes up an octave because it's got a node in the middle. And so you can play those harmonics. And he knew this harmonic nature of violin strings because he liked classical music. And he said, what if the electron cloud is behaving the same way? Like you got an S orbital and then you got a P orbital and you've got these standing waves around the nucleus. What if that would explain the discrete energy levels? And, and uh, Einstein read his thesis and said, this idea has merit, shared it with Schrodinger and the rest is history. Schrodinger saw the hydrogen atom spectrum using de Broglie's idea of waves. The, there were different scientists that uh, analyzed the hydrogen spectrum. And here are their names. So the Balmer series is actually the one that uh, is in the visible region. But then there's the Passion series. Let's see if there's wavelength. So this is short wavelength. So the Lyman series is in the UV. The Balmer series is in the visible. The Passion is in the infrared and the bracket is even more in the infrared. So we had different scientists um, analyze these different ones. Passion and bracket were probably using, I don't know exactly, but they were probably using salt prisms. And so they were able to measure in the infrared using salt uh, refraction of light using salt prisms, kind of like what we have in the infrared. So, so here it is drawn in kind of a, a, a rudimentary Grotrian diagram. So we have the energy axis on the, on the Y axis and then we have these different series set up, and these are the, the shells. So in hydrogen, you have the n equals one shell, the n equals two shell, the n equals three shell. And so now we can see that the, the Lyman series all start at n equals one, and that series of lines are the differences between one going to two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And you see that all those arrows are pretty long, and so this is in the UV. Okay. 
And then the bomber series, these arrows here are in the visible region. In fact, just three of them are in the visible region. And then the passion, you see how short those arrows are. Really not arrows, but you could draw the arrows. If it's absorption, then they're going up. Okay, if it's emission, they're going down. Those arrows are, you know, this is the visible length of arrow. This is the infrared length. So these are in the IR, all of these right here. Now, if we're doing emission, which again, if we have this in an electric discharge, we're probably doing emission because the, the atoms are being excited. And then as the electrons come back to the proton, they hop down through those energy levels and they emit photons as they go down. Do y'all ever play the game Pachinko? You ever heard of this? It's like a, it's kind of like a vertical pinball machine. Um, there's, it's a, a, in Japan, they have a bunch of little Pachinko parlors. It's kind of like their slot machine. And you have these steel ball bearings and you wreck, you hit this lever and it shoots it up at the top and it bounces through all these pegs. And then it ends up into different little buckets and they get, you get more money or you get more balls if you hit a 500 than like a 10 or something like that. Or it bounces all the way through and makes it to the bottom and you get nothing. That's the way I think of spectroscopy. So you got an electric arc in this tube and you got hydrogen gas. Hydrogen comes as a molecule, H2, right? but there's electricity flowing through this. And so it breaks the, the bond. And so then you have hydrogen atoms and then it ionizes the hydrogen atom. And so you got a proton and an electron. The electron finds the proton because the opposites attract. And then that's the pachinko game. The electron goes ding, 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 all the way through. N equals five, four, three, two, one, zero, you know, or does it go? To, no, just to one. Okay. One is the ground state. So it, it's ping, 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 pinging through as it gets closer to the nucleus and it's spitting out photons as it goes. So that's the pachinko game in my mind. You're sitting here, you've got electricity going through this discharge tube and you're, the nature's going tchka, 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 and the balls are going up and they're ping, 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 bouncing through the electron cloud and relaxing as it goes. It's spitting out photons. So that's, and the photons come out based on the selection rules. So if there's not a allowed transition, it may make it some way, but it won't spit out light when it does that. It'll, it'll get to that level some other way, but it won't spit out light if there's no, if it's not allowed by selection rules. So the energy levels in the Grotrian diagram are the energies of the whole atom. So when an electron goes from N equals five to N equals four, that whole atom has an N equals five. So it has this energy level. And when it goes to four, it has this energy level. And the difference is the photon of light that comes shooting out. So these energy levels in the Grotrian diagram are the energies for the whole atom. That's one of the big problems that, that people have. It's incorrect to treat these energy levels as individual orbital energy levels. Now, hydrogen would be the only case where that might be the case because there's only one electron. But in all the other multi-electron atoms, it doesn't make sense to say that that's the energy level for the 2p orbital and the 3d orbital or whatever. When you see all those lines on there, that is the energy for a, an atom with a particular electron configuration. So we'll, 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 see, we'll see why that's the case. So let's stay with hydrogen for now, but then we'll get to helium and go on up to mercury. So here's the Grotrian diagram for hydrogen. You see for the hydrogenic orbitals, there's no difference between the, the S. So this is the 2S uh, electron configuration is 2S1. For this one, the electron configuration is 2P1. For this one is a 3s1, 3p1, 3d1. So this is the electron configuration for the whole atom, and there's only one electron. Notice that there's no energy level difference, no energy difference between the s, the p, and the d orbitals for a one electron uh, atom. And so this shows the energy levels separated by n and l. So as you go up, on the Grotrian diagram, you see you get higher and higher in, uh, shells. So n equals one, n equals two, and so on. And then as you go across, that's where you change angular momentum. So this is L equals zero, L equals one, L equals two. And you can see that across the top up here. Um, notice the selection rules, okay? Can you see the selection rules from this Grotrian diagram? Well, yes. Um, this. This difference, see this blue line right there? 
that's delta n equals minus 1. Right? It went from n equals 2 down to n equals 1. It's going to get real busy, but I'll try to write legibly. This one is delta n equals minus 2 because it's going from 3 down to 1. This one right here is delta n equals minus 3. So it looks like the, the change in principal quantum number n is unrestricted. Okay, and it is. So the delta n can be anything. It can go up and down any number of integers. What about L? Okay, it appears from this these allowed transitions in the Grotrian diagram for the hydrogen spectrum that the quantum, the angular momentum quantum number is restricted. So what do we see with all of these arrows? It's probably in your notes, but but try to look at the arrows and see how we would determine that that L quantum number. So it's plus or minus one only. So you can see across the top here, L equals zero, one, two, and three. And so going from, from P to S, going this direction, that's delta L equals minus one. We also have some going from, from D to P. That's also delta L equals minus one. If we were to do absorption, the arrow of heads would just change ends on those sticks and then we would be going plus one. So plus or minus one. And again, that's that's related to light only having one angular unit of angular momentum. And we can see those selection rules. Now, what would be one that would break this selection rule? Well, let's let's say we maybe we found a, a weak transition up here that went from um, F to P. So if we saw that transition, if we saw those two levels connected, then that would be delta L equals minus two. Now, occasionally you'll find one or two of those transitions, but they're the exception, not the rule. The rule is delta L plus or minus one. Um, what's allowing those uh, plus or minus two transitions or three transitions in, in delta L is when we end up with spin orbit coupling. And so we're allowing the electrons um, to couple the little spin on the electron is coupling with the angular momentum quantum number and allowing some relaxation of the selection rules in terms of the strict L plus or minus one selection rule. Okay, so now let's look at helium. What do you notice first? We, this, was the, this was the hydrogen Grotrian diagram. SPDF across the top. One, two, three, four, you know, the in quantum numbers going up. We go to helium now. We've got two electrons. And now we've got like almost two diagrams. We've got a diagram here and a diagram here. And what's happening is, notice up there we have singlet and triplet states. What does that mean? Well, that's the number of unpaired electrons. Well, now that we have two electrons, they can be paired up or they can be unpaired. And so that's where we get the singlet and the triplet. So this is not a single electron system. The ground state of helium is the alpha bow like electron configuration. So what do we what do we know that to be? That's going to be this this two s one s two. So that's the ground state electron configuration. So like we learned the alpha bow setup, what did, what would we see for helium? Well, we know that's the second of you know the s. So Hydrogen is 1s1, helium would be 1s2, okay? But then the, the excited states, if, if these are all s orbitals, then this one right here is not going to be 2s2, it's going to be 1s, 2s. So we've just excited one of the electrons up. And this one would be 1s, 3s. And those two electrons are still paired up. So in the singlet setup, there's um, the multiplicity. Let me, well, we'll talk about multiplicity in a minute. Okay. But here we have all of the electron configurations for helium. So this is the same diagram now just spread out over the whole page. So those are the electron configurations for every, you know, type of atom in, in the uh, helium atom. Let's talk about multiplicity. 
So the spin, the, the m sub s quantum number is equal to plus one half. It could be plus or minus. It could be spin up or spin down. Okay. And the multiplicity is equal to 2s plus 1. Okay. And so this s right here is the total spin on the atom. Okay. So we add those uh, those electron spins together, and if, if we had uh, a plus one half and a plus one half, what does that equal? That equals one. And so then two s plus one would be two times one plus one equals three. So that's a triplet. So when we see these these triplet states here. That's the multiplicity. We've already had to kind of talk about that when we did the Gaussian calculations. And so if you have unpaired electrons, you have a triplet state. So like ground state oxygen is a triplet because the unpaired electrons in the, in the p orbitals. Okay, so um, what if the electrons were, were paired up? So if you had a, an up electron and a down electron, well then S would equal plus one half minus one half, and that's equal to zero. So 2 times 0 plus 1 is equal to 1, which is a singlet. And that's what we have over here. These are the singlet states. An easy way to think about this is that multiplicity is just the, the number of unpaired electrons plus 1. Okay. So if a singlet has 0 unpaired electrons, you just add 1 to it and you get a singlet. Uh, if you have two unpaired electrons, add one to that and you get a, a triplet. Okay. What if you had just one unpaired electron? Add one to that and you get a doublet. Okay. It's going to be only the, the, the last one. So as you complete a shell, so like 1s2, since those are all paired up, uh, then that's by definition going to be a singlet. Uh, but then when you go to like lithium, you have three electrons, but we ignore all the completed shells. And so we just look at that last electron. And so for lithium, it would be a doublet because it has to have one unpaired electron because it only has one extra electron. And so we'll get more into that when we come up with these term symbols. So right now we just talked about the singlet and the triplet, but, but next lecture, we're going to learn about how we get the capital S and the capital P, okay? They're related to the angular momentum quantum number of lowercase s, lowercase p, lowercase d, and so on. But we'll have to figure out how to get those capital letters. And so this is a part of the course that gets a little tedious because it is case sensitive. So a little s is different than a capital S. And a little p is different than a capital P. So we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. But the main point I want to show you on this diagram is that we have electron configurations for for excited state atoms. And so the atom with that energy has a 1s2p configuration. So it's got one electron in the 1s orbital, one electron in the 2p orbital. And you look at that and you go, but that isn't what I learned with the Aufbau filling scheme. Right. This is the only one you've learned with the Aufbau filling scheme. The Aufbau filling scheme only gives us the ground state. Okay. But you can have all of these other excited states and the Grotrian diagram is there to tell you what those energies are. So if you say, what is the energy of an atom with the 1s, 2p uh, electron configuration? Well, it's 21 eV, okay? So then let's look at this. Uh, this We talked about the first ionization energies and so on. So here's this 25 eV, that's the ionization energy for this helium. Let me erase all of this because this calculation is being done right here in the corner. So let's see what that is in terms of, of wavelength. So this would be the ionization energy for helium. So 25 eV, this is a good conversion factor. You have 96.485 kilojoules per mole per eV. 
Okay, that's Faraday's constant. Essentially, it's converting coulombs over into uh, joules and so on. So, um, so 25 electron volts is 2,412 kilojoules per mole. So that's pretty high energy, 2,000 kilojoules. And so then let's convert that over to, um, to wavelength so that, that delta E is uh, inversely proportional to wavelength. And so we can put all our constants in there. Everything cancels out, convert it to nanometers. And it's 49.6 nanometers. That's a really small wavelength. So that's deep UV. We call that vacuum UV. Okay. So visible light obviously goes through helium. It's a, it's a transparent gas. Um, even UV light goes through, but the vacuum UV would be enough to ionize that, that atom. Okay. Okay, so this um, this Grotrian diagram, you might ask, well, where do these come from? I mean, we're not going to be able to do these experiments and actually generate the, this, uh, the, the uh, Grotrian diagrams, but we can look them up. So the, one of the benefits of our government is to fund organizations like the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST. And, and so they have an atomic spectral database, which has collected the, the physics data from everybody that's done uh, atomic physics on, on atoms, and they have this atomic spectral database. Now this, uh, you might come across this as a chemist who's doing atomic absorption or emission spectroscopy. So if you go over to uh, the Texas Research Institute for Environmental Studies, TRIES, it's an analytical lab that we have here on campus. It's a commercial analytical lab, and it will test people's water for contaminants. And one of the best ways to do that is atomic spectroscopy. So they'll take the water, they'll, they'll put in some nitric acid or, or some sort of strong acid to, to um, tear up any kind of compound you have. Like maybe you have some calcium oxide and you want to strip off the oxide and just make the calcium ion. So you get all these ions in solution, you nebulize them into a, a inductively coupled plasma, so an argon plasma that's coupled, that, that, that's sort of ionized by oscillating radio frequency. So it makes this little, like, super high temperature torch, and your, your liquid goes into that torch, all the water evaporates, all the compounds are broken, and you have atoms that come out. Okay, and then the, uh, the atoms emit light because they're super hot. You get the pachinko game, electrons come back down on the calcium ion, and make a calcium atom emits all of those atomic spectra, uh, spectral lines. And this will tell you what lines to look for, for calcium or sodium or mercury or any of those metals, okay, or, or non-metals too, okay. So that's a, that's a great spectroscopic tool, but there are thousands and thousands of spectral lines. So if you get an unknown line, maybe you have some unknown contaminant in the water, and you can look on this database for the most probable species that that might be. Or let's say the Texas Department of Corrections, which is one of their main clients, says we've got a new well over on this you know, prison area, which we, they monitor the groundwater and so on. Um, and uh, we think there's been a spill of some kind of, con let's say a spill of, um, I don't know, let's say, uh, Lithium brine water from, from Arkansas is traveling across the state, spills uh, in this area, and they want to test where that plume is. Then we can test for lithium, which is not a common uh, uh, thing that you would test for. So you would go in here and you would find what's the brightest emission line on lithium, and then you would be able to see that. So here's, a, here's the form that you would fill out. Like This is set up for mercury. I've got the visible range, 400 to 800. I've got the units in nanometers. Um, I put in some electron temperatures and so on to, to um, model the spectrum. Uh, also, you can retrieve the data, and you can also make a Grotrian diagram. So you can, you can play around with this. Here's, the, here's the, um, the lines data. So this is telling you the spectral lines. And if, I, if, if you don't come out of this course with anything else, just be able to say that a spectral line is a difference between energy levels, <laughs> right? You got two energy levels. The difference is the spectral line. Okay. And so that's what we see here. We see here are the two energy levels. This is the difference here. It's giving you the, the wavelength. Um, it's giving you something related to the intensity. These are not very high intensities. You get down here and it'll be like 50,000, you know, so it's 10 to the minus nine, 10 to the minus nine. Where do these numbers come from? Those are the uh, transition dipole moment intervals. So the, the theoretical, Intensity for all of these energy differences 
uh, using the atomic uh, weight functions and so on. So here's the Grotrian diagram for sodium. Lots of lines, uh, lots of levels. I mean. So look at all those energy levels. And then down here at the bottom, you see the key for these vertical columns. Okay, so let's zoom in on that. And this is what we see down here at the bottom. So we see this 2P6NS. So this is for sodium. Does that make sense? Look for sodium. 2P6, yeah, that's the end of the neon core. They left off the 1S2 and 2S2, but you get it, right? It's, it's 2P6. The other stuff is assumed. So you have 1S2, 2S2, 2P6. That's the neon core. And then dot NS. So the next thing is the NS. And so that makes sense, right? The first one would be 3S. But this also this column here, that's this one here, this 2P6 in it. This is this whole column. So they use that word, that letter, letter N, to indicate the principal quantum number for that last electron. It could be in the 3S, or the 4S, or the 5S, 6, 7, 8. Look how far, how far up it goes. They, they kind of merge together, but you could count them up. You've got, you know, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. I can count to 14 before it just becomes a black block. Okay. And then the next one is 2P6NP. So what do you think that one would be? Well, that one's going to be, which is the next N for the P block? I think I have them revealing here. Yeah, so this is the the up to the neon core, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1, and this next one, come on, is 3p, right? Because look at the 2p is full. Boron through neon is the 2p. And so the very next available p orbital is a 3. So it's a 3p. The next one is 4s. And then you got to 3D, okay? Again, that's the next available D orbital would be a 3D. Then you have a 4P is the next one. And then I've skipped the, the 5S, but it's over there on, on the left. And then the, the first one, the 4F, is the first F block spot. So you, you, should be able to, you should be able to do the electron configurations for all of these excited states using a Grotrian diagram. And there's a homework assignment associated with that. Okay. But given a Grotrian diagram and given this key down at the bottom, you should be able to do all of those that I've shown. So it's, it's, it's gotten a little bit more advanced than just the alpha <laughs> filling scheme for the ground state atom. Okay. This is what we did the last time. Now we've added a little bit more complexity. We've added the Grotrian diagram and all the excited states. Um, there's one strong line in sodium. That's this one here, the 589 nanometer line. And it's in the yellow region. And so it, it's interpreted by your brain as yellow light. Okay, it's get a little bit of red, a little bit of green. It's hitting two pigments in your eye, in your retina. And so, uh, it shows up as yellow. And you've seen, maybe you've seen street lights. This was a picture of uh, Santa Rosa, California. They replaced all of their street lights with LED lights. And so they got away from the yellow light and to more white light. It seems more pleasing. The sodium lights were really cheap because sodium is ubiquitous. So they put a little sodium into a little um, uh, ionization chamber and run a little bit of electricity through that. They start out with high voltage, get it to ionize, and then the current drops, and it's a very efficient light. It gives off a lot of photons for very little electricity. But it's yellow, and people get tired of, you know, the plain yellow light. We like white light better. Yeah. Oh, it also goes up to H and, and I on this Grotrian diagram. So that's the neon core 7I1. Crazy. Okay, here's mercury. Now, mercury is a little funny because uh, the ground state is not what we would get from the alpha principle. So there's the sodium vapor light compared to a mercury vapor light. That's, a, that's right when the mercury vapor light starts, it's green. You don't have really white light coming out of it. 
and we'll see why in a second. So these are the spectral lines that we get from Mercury. So they're the colors, there's the red line, the green line, and the blue line. And so even though Mercury's toxic, we use Mercury in all of our fluorescent lights because it, it's efficient, doesn't use a lot of electricity, and uh, it gives white light. So, you know, we like that. And so it's we'll use it even though it's a small amount in each of those tube lights that, that you could breathe in if it broke. Um, it's not good for you. So if you break a... A mercury vapor lamp. Um, let everything cool down, and then, and then I would say, um, well, there's instructions online for how to clean it up. I don't want to give recommendations, so follow the instructions. Okay, so then uh, let's look at this this key down here. We kind of did this last time uh, for for mercury, but let's look at it again. So there's that that ground state is the six S one six P one. And 7P1, 8P1, 9P1. So you see we're in that column where we're just changing that P orbital by the qu the n quantum number. And then up here is the alpha-bow one. So this is the ground state that we would have come up using the alpha-bow rules. 4F14, 5D10, and 6S2. Okay, so this is what I wanted to show. The, the, the mercury, when it first started starts, the mercury light is green because this black line and that black line are the ground state mercury lines. But as it warms up, it becomes more white because this line is due to the ion. And so that's, we're not going to get into that, but that shows that, uh-oh, things can be even more complicated because if mercury loses two electrons, it's HG2, that's a common oxidation state for mercury, and now we have a new pachinko game. We have an electron coming onto a two minus or a two plus cation. And so the two plus cation has its own Grotrian diagram. And so its own pachinko game, and some of those lines are in the visible spectrum. So when mercury heats up, it starts out with a blue and a green line. So it's kind of green looking. And then as it warms up, we get more mercury ions, and that gives us the red photon. And so that becomes more white as it warms up. So if you ever in a high school gym or whatever, you turn the lights on, it's kind of green, it starts out, but then as those big banks of lights warm up, then it gets whiter and whiter because the ion is growing in concentration. So that's the atomic spectral database and simulated spectra. And this top one is taken with our little lab spectrometer um, looking at the lights.